Lord, from the incredible bounty that God has blessed us with. And, and God, God has been good to us. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. We hope that something that's said encourages you and ministers to you in this tough time. And we cannot wait to see you face cannot. to face. So enjoy service. Enjoy. We thank you so much just for who you are and what you've done. And right now, we just want to focus our attention on you. For all you've done, God, you've done so much. Even in this hard time, we can count on you. So we just invite you in and we ask, God, that you would be pleased with our worship, with our hearts to you this morning and every day of our lives. Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to see you this Sunday morning. I'm excited uh, to gather together one more time around this, the word of our great king. Certainly believe that uh, God has been good to you. And if you're open, uh, your eyes are open and you're alive this morning, then it is a beautiful day to give God praise for this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, with me to Acts chapter number two. Acts chapter number two. We're going to um, give a cursory glance, if you will, today through the entire chapter of Acts chapter number two. Um, but I want to lift into our hearing the conclusion of Acts chapter two, beginning at verse number 40. Acts chapter two, beginning at verse number 40. And you'll find these words recorded there. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who received his word, those who gladly received his word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this great opportunity that you give us to rally around your word one more time. God, I pray for every home, every family represented, every issue, every concern on the hearts of these who are yours. Lord, I pray you'd meet every need in our life. Draw us closer to you. And now, Lord, as we approach this preaching moment, we pray you'd hide the preacher safely behind the bloodstained cross of Calvary that we might hear from you and not from me. I've studied, Lord, but I need your strength. Prepared, Lord, but I certainly need your power. And so, Lord, I ask you to do it again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning, as we look at this second chapter in Dr. Luke's letter uh, concerning the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, I want to share around the, uh, the idea or the theme, uh, the Christocentric church. The Christocentric church. I want to talk about the church today. And I, I, I want to I wanna begin by letting you know that I absolutely love the Lord's church. My, my testimony is, and many of you know, I'm a fourth generation uh, preacher. I, I'm, I'm a son, grandson, and great grandson of preachers. And, 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 and as far as I can remember, I vividly remember telling my second grade teacher that I believed I was going to be a pastor. Um, I remember the first pastor that I can recall, uh, Reverend Benny Smith, and, and I remember vividly him preaching. I was, I was an interesting child. Pastor Smith was my pastor until I was about age seven. And so during these early years of my formation, I can vividly recall Pastor Smith standing to preach and declaring the word of the Lord. He had a metallic uh, robe. One of his robes was metallic and it had gold metallic fabric on it. And he would preach, but he would would, he would very often get on his tippy toes when he was making a point. And, and to this day, as I preach the gospel, uh, I, I find myself from time to time getting on my tippy toes to make a point. I was impacted by the ministry of Pastor Smith. And from 7 to 18, uh, I was under uh, our pastor, Dr. Raymond Gordon, in, in Williamstown, New Jersey, an incredible uh, Bible teacher and preacher. And under his ministry, I recognized and learned the preeminence of Jesus and the priority 
priority of biblical exposition. And, 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 and there are many things that Dr. Gordon said in my formative years that you are the beneficiaries of today. I say things that I heard as a child and they've stuck with me uh, some 21 years later. And, and of course, my parents and, and my grandparents, they have poured into me um, the gospel and then used the church of Jesus Christ as added guide rails or guardrails to my life. So I am standing today a beneficiary of the church of Jesus Christ. I love the church. And, and, and I need to be clear, I'm not in the camp of those who claim that the church is done, that the church is finished. I don't care what the numbers say. I don't care what, what, what the reports are, what, what, what the statistics look like. I believe the word of God is true. And Jesus said to Peter, upon the confession of your faith, upon recognition that I am the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the very gates of hell will not uh, overpower it or prevail against it. And so while I believe that the universal visible church will not succumb to this pandemic, in this season of pandemic and social distancing, I believe that it has exposed some troubling realities in the Christian church. Uh, and particularly the church of Jesus Christ here uh, in the West. And, and that is this, simply that, that we have been so focused on Sundays. We've been so focused on our performance, on our numbers, on our size. We've tied significance to how many we could get into a room. We, we've been so focused on our lights and on our production and on our flows and our attire and our appearances and our prominence that I would submit to you many of us have taken our eyes off of Jesus. Wow. While I was in seminary, there was a young pastor in class with us from mainland China, and, and, and he would say to us, you guys get to become pastors because you go to school and because your church affirms you through ordination. He said, in, in my home, we become pastors when we're ready and willing to die like Jesus died. It, it, it blew our mind in class, and, and I heard of another a pastor who was doing a pastor's conference here in the U.S., and a question was raised to him, and it was simply this, what, what is the most amazing thing uh, that you see in the church in America? And he thought for a while, and then he responded this way, I am amazed at how much the church in the West does without Jesus. Whew. That thing rocked me when, when, when I heard that, and, 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 and I, I, I submit to you that I, we ought to be careful that in our pursuit of perfection, we don't walk away from our perfecter. I hope you heard what I just said, that in our passion for excellence, we have made an exit from the things that ought to be a priority for those who are named Christians. Man, perhaps in this season of pandemic, and social distancing. This is actually an opportunity for the church of Jesus Christ to reset itself, to revisit the biblical mandate and the message and the mission that God gave us in the church's inception. I heard a pastor say it like this, the church at its birth was the church at its best. And, and, and I want to submit to us this morning uh, that I believe God is yet calling us back to the foundational truth of what he established the church to be. And right here in Acts chapter 2, I simply want to point out four quick things that I believe we can divide Acts chapter 2 uh, in these four different ways and have biblical integrity as we walk through the passage today. Four things I want to show us in the passage today and then I'm going to pray for us. Number one is that there is a prerequisite and power. Number two, there's a prequel and a pronouncement. Number three, there's a posture and a promise. And then number four, there's the planting and the propelling. I know y'all heard the alliterations. I told y'all I was a church boy. I've been shaped by the church. So let's look at the text together. Let's experience the text together, if you will. We read into your hearing the last seven verses of the chapter, but let's begin at verse number one. Look at what it says. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. First thing I want you to see is this prerequisite and power. Last week, 
We talked about the extent to which the people of God should go with the gospel, that he has made us uh, ambassadors for him. He made an investment. He's given us his intention and his instructions were that we go to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And so the Lord Jesus has promised to empower the people with his enabling person of the Spirit of God, and then they would be able to be witnesses for the Lord. And so the disciples are obedient and they go back to Jerusalem. Everything in chapter 1 is a precursor, if you will, to this great outburst of the Spirit that we see in chapter 2. And I want to submit to you really quickly the prerequisite for the power of God. Watch this. You're looking for something deep. I got it real simple for you. Prayer. It, and here it is. It happened after Prayer. We did a series a, a while back about prayer under that title. It happened after prayer. Dr. H.B. Charles wrote an incredible little book on prayer entitled It Happened After Prayer. And all it simply means is that every single thing, every time God makes a significant move, it's always after prayer. And can I submit to you that many of the failures of our life have been a result of internal dyslexia because we got it backwards and we thought we could do our thing and then pray and God would bless our mess. We, we, we did it first and then asked God to bless it. We took the job and then prayed for God to help us to sustain it. We, we bought the car and then asked the Lord, would you help us make the payment? We, we had the wedding and then asked the Lord to bless the marriage. Stop, Pastor Chris text tells us that the prerequisite for the power was found in prayer. I'm all up in the text because in Acts chapter 1, verse number 12, look at your Bible, look at what it says. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Watch who's there. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Zealot. Judas, the son of James, these all continued with one accord, watch this, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Turn over to Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I love the continuity of scripture. They left Jesus telling them they're going to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. They went back like obedient disciples to Jerusalem to wait for the Spirit of God. And then this text says they're all there together having prayer meeting. They have they have been steadfast in prayer. They, they're praying in the upper room all day, all night. Their prayer meeting, watch this, was for days. <clears throat> not, not an hour, not, not a half hour, but these folks were in sincere prayer to the Lord. Here it is. Our steadfastness precedes our suddenly. Because the text says they were praying and suddenly something happened. I'm glad that we still serve a God of suddenly. If you will be steadfast in pursuit of him, he can still bring suddenlies in your life. The text says suddenly there was a sound, there was a sign, and there was speech. It's right in the text. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled the whole house where they were sitting. There was a sign. Then appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And then there was speech, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, and I want you to know this really quickly. April and I are going to hop on probably the middle of this week and have some further discussion around what takes place in Acts chapter 2 and its implications for the body of Christ. But this is this word in the text is glossolalia. It's the word we get glossary from. It speaks to known languages, uh, languages that were known and understood, but it was given to people who had not studied, had not learned those languages. And so they were speaking languages that they did not know, but the purpose wasn't simply so that they could be in awe but so that people who they did not know could hear the truth of the gospel. I'll prove it to you in the text. That these guys experienced something supernatural. I'm talking about real power. Look at the text, verse number 6. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together 
and was confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language, in the language in which we were born? Begins to name all the places. Go down to verse number 11. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking, watch this, in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. There's one lesson in the text for us today, and, and, and I think we can take this plenty of lessons, but one I want us to lift today, and that's simply this, that God's enabling power has always been to strengthen our communication ability to those who don't know him. You missed what I said. The purpose of the sound, the sign, and the speech wasn't just to show the wonder of the Lord. It was to communicate his worth and his works to the world. When Jesus empowers the church, he empowers the church, watch this, so that we can communicate to the world the wonderful works of our God. That's the end of verse number 11. It said, this is what they will say. What we heard when all of those tongues were being spoken, we heard in our own tongues the wonderful works of the Lord. The church is the church. When the church understands the prerequisite and the power, secondly, the church is the church. When the church understands the prequel and the pronouncement, I, I, I won't read it all until you're hearing the beginning of verse number 14 all the way down to verse number 36. But, but if you look at this passage, it's really amazing uh, because time won't allow me uh, to walk through it verse by verse. But I, I'll tell you this, Peter stands up and he begins to give a beautiful and persuasive argument uh, regarding what's taking place. Because here's what's happened. People are starting to talk. People, you know how church folk are. They're starting to talk. They're saying, man, something for all these folk are drinking. It's, early. it's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're already twisted. They, they're, they're, they're already tilted. They, they're already, you know, they're already three sheets to the wind. And so, so Peter stands up to, to, to clarify any confusion. Peter says, you know what, it's, it would be better for me to just give you all a clear picture. And so Peter calls three witnesses to the stand to make an argument on behalf of the people of God. He calls Joel, he calls Jesus, and he calls David. Man, I wish I had time. Peter begins by giving them this picture of what the prophet Joel said. He said, you remember what Joel wrote in chapter 2. This is in verse 17 to 21. He said, and Joel said, in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And upon my maid servants and my men servants, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Peter says, hey, hey, you guys should know what's going on. We're not drunk as you suppose we we haven't been drinking but but this is what Joel was talking about Peter says you you ought to know better because you had the, the 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 scripture you had the the prophetic writing of Joel you should have seen this and recognized this is what is happening here he said and just so we're clear about why this is happening he said let's check in with Jesus verse 23 to 24 he says Jesus of Nazareth the man Attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God wrought through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. Listen to Peter. You crucified him. You put him to death, whom God raised him up. Why, Peter? Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. I'm so glad that as a preacher, I can just cry out in the middle of my sermon. One Friday, he died. But even though he died on Friday, early Sunday morning, he got up. Peter says it's the same Jesus. The reason, the reason we're acting the way we're acting is because that same Jesus who you crucified, he got up from the grave. Peter said, you got Joel's testimony. You got Jesus's example. And he said, and if that ain't good enough, Peter says, I know y'all love David. He ends, he ends his, his soliloquy here. He says, men and brethren, can I speak freely to you about the patriarch David? that he's both dead 
and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter says, listen, David said that, that David said that, 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 that God would not leave his soul in Hades, nor would he allow his holy one to see corruption. And, and Peter said, clearly David wasn't talking about himself because his grave is still over there. His bones are still there. But David prophetically was talking about the Messiah. David is dead and buried, but Jesus is alive. That's why David could say, the Lord said to my Lord. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm going to let you sit down until I give you, you make your enemies your footstool. David, David is clear that David has a clear under, understanding uh, of the prophetic word that he was saying. In other words, Peter is saying, David wrote this, but David was talking not about himself, but about the Messiah who was to come. Peter makes this argument to the believers. He says, there was a, there was a, 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 a prequel to this. Joel told us what was going to happen. David told us what was going to happen. Jesus himself demonstrated what was going to happen. And you saw it with your own eyes. And so David, so Peter makes this pronouncement at the end of this passage in verse number 36. He says, at the end of his statement, he says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the pronouncement in the text that Jesus is both Lord, Curios, Master of the World, Adonai, Headship and Authority, and Christ, Christos, the Anointed, the Messiah. He said he's both Curios and Christos. And, 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 and if the church is going to be the church, we got to settle the issue of Curios and Christos. The Lord of the church can't be tradition. The Lord of the church can't be the way we always did it. The Lord of the church can't be uh, what we're wearing on our Sunday service outfits. No, the Lord of the church must be the Christ. Jesus is both Lord and and Christ, I celebrate the fact that in our church we lift Jesus up, and that nobody else gets the glory, only Jesus. So we see that, we see the, the prequel and the, the pronouncement, and then we see the posture and the promise. I want you to see the response to the people now, because Peter has just wrecked them. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The posture was of repentance and identification. Repentance is a term that means I am going to turn 180 degrees and I'm going to now walk in the direction that the Lord has called me to walk in. When I repent, I'm simply agreeing with God that you're right, Lord, and I'm wrong. And then not only do I need to repent, I need to publicly identify with the Lord Jesus through baptism. That's what the text says. This idea of baptism was a public display. It wasn't simply, simply something that we did uh, one Sunday a month in the local church, but it was something that was done in the community where everybody could see you have made a declaration that I'm longer the old me, but I, the old me has died. I've gone into the watery grave and I've been resurrected with Jesus to new life to now live differently. Peter says this posture needs to be both repentance and identification. Repentance and renouncing the old way. Church can't simply be a pep rally with no challenge. <laughs> I'm glad Pastor Peter stood up and preached, and he preached till folks' hearts were broken. He preached till tears fell. He preached till guilt and shame uh, ransacked the room. And that's what the body of Christ ought to be. Our gathering ought not just always make you give people high fives. Every once in a while, it ought to make you check yourself. It ought, to, it, ought to, it ought to not always make you feel good. It ought to comfort the afflicted, as Pastor Jay would say, and afflict the comfortable. Church ought not simply be a place 
where we cheer each other on. It ought to be a place where we're challenged and where repentance is the, the call of the day, where we always end by calling one, calling somebody to salvation, calling somebody to know that the promise, watch this, of the Lord is for you. All you got to do is respond in faith. And so we see that in the text. We see the promise in verse 39. For the promise is for you and for your children and to all who are far off, that as many as the Lord our God will call. Whenever we open the word of the Lord, whenever we rally around the word of the Lord, we have to recognize the Lord is calling men and women to come to him. The church has to remember that our purpose is to be evangelistic. Our purpose is to be a light in dark places. Our purpose is to call men and women to a place of repentance and identification that they're willing not simply to say, I'm sorry, but they're willing to turn and follow Jesus. Last thing I want to say to you this morning, and I want to pray for you, is that the this text shows me the planting and propelling of the Lord's church. It's in the text. Uh, verse number 40 we read into our hearing. And when many other words he tested with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received of the word, his word were baptized that day. And that day about three thousand souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And then fear came on every soul. And the wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were, watch this, together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And so they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. <laughs> Pastor James and I have been prayerfully uh, praying through uh, the development and implementation ultimately of a reentry or reconstitution plan for the day that our churches will be able to reenter our respective buildings. And I, I submit to you, um, that we will one day soon prayerfully gather together again in the corporate assembly of the saints. And, 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 and the singular question that the Church of Jesus Christ needs to be asking itself after COVID, what are the essential elements of the church? What is it that makes the Church of Jesus Christ effective? We need to really evaluate what needs to be prioritized and what needs to be purged. And it's a good thing. It's, it's not a bad thing uh, because we got a biblical frame of reference for what the church looked like at its birth. And remember I said what the church looked like at its birth was the best example of what the church ought to be. So our text gives us this picture of the church. And if we're honest, if we're honest, I want to be honest today. Those of you who watch me, you know, I want to be as honest and transparent as I can be. The church today... In many cases, the church universal, the churches around the world, in many of our cases, our churches look more like Fortune 500 companies than like Acts chapter 2. We look more like production centers than the church in Acts chapter 2. We look more like celebrity makers than we look like the church in Acts chapter 2. More like production centers and concert halls than we look like the church in Acts chapter 2. We got many conference rooms and coffee bars, but very little connection and commitment to the Christ. What are the biblical elements of the local church? I'm going to blow your mind probably, but I want to submit to you that many of our traditions, although not innately sinful, have subverted the intention of the church. And we all need to consider that this might be a good time that the Lord has given to us to do some repenting, some rebuilding, some re-engaging of God's mission, because the end game for the church has always been Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Simply put, and I'm out of your way, the church ought to be those who are steadfast in the word. We ought to be steadfast in the word. There ought not be anything else 
that takes precedent over the word of the Lord. I don't care how great the sound is. I don't care how beautiful the sanctuary is. I don't care how incredible the music is. I don't care how vast the crowd is. The priority of our gathering must be the word of the Lord. We ought to be steadfast in the word. We ought to be consistent in our fellowship koinonia, in our building of relationships, in our one anothering. Uh, Pastor James on Wednesday has been, he began last week and will be continuing this week to talk about how we ought to one another, how we ought to love one another, or we ought to pray for one another, we ought to serve one another. That is the koinonia of the church. That is the benchmark of the church. That's one of the reasons why this social isolation or social distancing is so hard because we've been designed for koinonia. We've been designed for relationships. And the church of Jesus Christ ought to be a place where koinonia is, is fostered and, and, and is cultivated. We ought to be steadfast in the word. We ought to be consistent in fellowship. We ought to be faithful in prayer. We ought to make prayer a priority of our life and our gathering. Uh, moving forward, every single thing we do as a church must be bathed in prayer. It must be submitted to the Lord that the Lord might bless it before we move. I don't care what was on the calendar last year. If we haven't laid it on the altar before the Lord, it's not fit to be used in the kingdom of God because everything that God wants to do will happen after prayer. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be steadfast in the word consistent in fellowship, faithful in prayer. Watch this, concern for the less fortunate. The text says they sold all their stuff, had everything in common, and they gave to whoever had need. I want to submit to you that the real benchmark, the way you can really begin to walk out this gospel is when you care about some people who are not you. When you're not the priority of your heart's intention, that you're willing to serve the less fortunate, you look like the church of Jesus Christ. When you maintain godly unity, when we work together, when we endeavor to keep the, the unity of the spirit, when we, when we don't allow things that are secondary to cause us to be divided, but we come together under the primary thing, which is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we praise our King, I want you to know praise is comely to our God. We ought to praise the Lord, not simply in the sanctuary. We ought to praise him everywhere we go, every day, in our homes, on our jobs. We ought to live lives, lives that praise and worship our king. And then watch this. We got to trust God for the results. The end of that passage says, and the Lord added daily. The Lord does the the, the results. The Lord brings the, the results of our faithfulness. We got to be faithful in those other things, steadfast in the word, consistent in fellowship, faithful in prayer, meeting the needs of the less fortunate, maintaining godly unity. When we do that, God says, I'll take care of the results. I'm finished this morning. I, I wish I had more to tell you, but I want to submit to you that the majority of the things that took place in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to verse 47, watch this, didn't take place in the temple. You, you, you know, I think we got it mixed up because we, we thought it was all about Sunday. And, 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 and we were more concerned about our seating capacity than our sending capacity. But I want to submit to you today that we need to be a people who are more concerned about those who leave our gathering to live the gospel than those who come to our gathering to simply pick at our table. Yeah, I believe we're going to gather again. I'm looking forward to it. Listen, if I were you, the day we say we can get back to worship, you ought to be the first one in the room. Uh, and we'll use all of the, the, the rules and regulations that are in place. But I want to be with the people of God. I want to praise the Lord together. We're going to get back together. But I want to submit to you that the church is only the church when we realize that our cyber sanctuary isn't simply the backup until we get back in the building. No, our cyber sanctuary is the foundation for our corporate gathering. My prayer for the church is that we would be better because of the time we spent with our families, because of the time we spent in our homes, because of the habits that we formed in this season where we were seeking the Lord, praying and worshiping together, that when we gather again together. It'll be explosive because our family time in the cyber sanctuary has exploded in our temple time together. That's my prayer. My prayer is that we would be the church. We'll be the church of Jesus Christ. The church 
at its birth was the church at its best because it was ch a church that was centered on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. All of this is wrought through the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you. Thank you for this, your word. Thank you for these, your people. And I pray, Lord, that something that was said today would take root in our hearts, produce fruit in our lives, and fruit that remains. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here and you've never placed saving faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, just like Peter, I want to call you to repentance. The Lord is yet standing by, leaning over the balcony of heaven, peering even now into your home, willing to receive you as his own. If you're here and you want to place saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's as simple as admitting that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again on the third day with all power, and he did it just for you, confessing with your mouth that he is Lord to the glory of God. And if you do that on the authority of the word, God will welcome you into his forever family. If that's the case, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us. Shoot us an email. Let us know you're listening. You can respond. You can send an email to east at rightwhereyouare.com. I'd love to hear from you. Pray for you. You can comment right here in the comment section on Facebook, and one of our team members will be so glad to reach out to you. We love you. We're praying for you. Let's worship the Lord together as we leave. Jesus was betrayed, that the Bible declares he shared the Passover meal with his friends in the upper room. And the Bible says after they had eaten, Jesus took a loaf of bread, he blessed it and he broke it, and he shared it with his friends and told them, this is my body, which is broken for you. In like manner, he took the cup, the common chalice, and the Bible says he took this cup of wine and shared it with his friends and told them, this is the new agreement the new covenant in my blood. Paul picks up on this thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and says, whenever we come to the Lord's table, we ought to come in a worthy way, not meaning that we could be perfect or deserving of the table, but we ought to come with clean hands and pure heart. He said, we ought to examine ourselves and then let us eat so that we do not eat or drink condemnation unto ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to eat or drink condemnation unto myself. So I want to pray a prayer of consecration. And as I pray, I invite you to pray right there in your homes that the Lord might consecrate our elements, that they might be moved from a carnal use to a spiritual use, and that we might forever remember the sacrifice that the Lord made on our behalf. Father, thank you for the beautiful gift that you've given us to join in common union with you through the Lord's table. I pray now, Lord, you take these elements from their carnal use to a supernatural use, that we would ever be mindful of the incredible price that you paid through your broken body and poured out blood for us. And Lord God, as we take this table, we're testifying to the world that you came uh, one time as a lamb led to the slaughter, but you're coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so, Lord, we ask you to forgive us of any of our known sins, sin of thought, word, deed, motive, attitude, sin of omission or commission, anything in us that's not like you. We ask you to cleanse us even now that we might eat and drink with clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your element of bread and let us eat in remembrance of the Lord. Amen. And I invite you now to take your cup, your fruit of the vine, that you might drink in remembrance of the Lord and drink ye all of it. Well, amen. Our holy and righteous reigning king, the one who ascended, 
will one day descend and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Bible says after they had ate and drank, they sang and went out to the Mount of Olives. And we're going to continue in our worship to our holy king as we prepare to leave from our gathering together today. God bless you. Go in peace. No one so holy And no one so worthy Nobody like you No one so faithful There is no one No one No one so holy yeah, yeah. No one so worthy Nobody like you No one so faithful You're true you're faithful, no one, no one, no one so holy, no one so holy, no one so worthy and worthy of praise, no one so faithful. Heaven's high, I can search the earth below, but there's nobody like you, Jesus. There is no one, no one. I can search the heavens high, I can search the earth below, but there's nobody like you. There is no one. No one, I can search the heavens high, search the 